Hi friends and new friends. The book is called Blockchain for Everyone and the author's name is Sir John Hargrave. I have Sir John Hargrave in today for an episode of Cash Alternative TV. This is an interview where we talk about a wide range of crypto topics. He's a well-traveled crypto pioneer and for those of you who have been in the business for a long time, you can definitely relate to this gentleman. And for those of you who are just watching and want to get into cryptocurrency, you should definitely take his advice when it comes to investing. I'm Christopher Carruthers, also known as Tao Satoshi, and you're watching Cash Alternative TV. So what is Cash Alternative TV other than that catchy jingle? Well, it's a show about digital currency with a focus on Dash, which aims to be a digital cash for the world, an alternative to cash. Hence the name Cash Alternative TV. If that's something that you're into, you want to learn more about Dash, or just want to hang out with me some more, don't forget to subscribe and click the bell so you won't miss an episode. So now on to today's topic. Well, this book here is called Blockchain for Everyone, and it's an interesting book, as you can tell. It's uh, all about cryptocurrency and uh, Bitcoin and, how, and discovering Bitcoin and falling down the rabbit hole that is digital currency right now. So this uh, guy, John Hargrave, he's into, uh, he has a lot of uh, funny stories to tell, and he's definitely an interesting guest. I'm sure you'll enjoy this interview. So without further ado, let's get into my interview with John Hargrave now. Welcome to the show, John. Christopher, I'm looking forward to it. It's going to be fun. Right on. It's good to have you here on Cash Alternative TV. So uh, we met on Twitter, and uh, you reached out and said you wanted to have an interview. And I, I find you very interesting with your uh, Blockchain for Everyone uh, uh, book. So we wanted to come on and talk to you about it, your experiences in crypto and your uh, authorship of this book. So uh, we're going to get right into it. Uh, can you uh, give yourself a brief introduction of who you are and how you got into this mess called cryptocurrency? Yeah, I uh, bought Bitcoin back in 2013. And uh, at the time, we didn't have your fancy Coinbase. Uh, it was really hard. And I had to go to my bank and send a wire transfer to Belarus. And I didn't even know where Belarus was on a map, uh, much less why I was sending money there. Uh, but I had to send a large sum of money to buy this Bitcoin, which at the time, uh, the price of a single Bitcoin was about $125. Uh, and I was buying a lot of them, sight unseen, wiring the money to Belarus. And uh, I gave this, uh, the, the wire transfer instructions to my bank teller, and I said, uh, where is this going? And he said, well, it's a wire transfer. You won't know if it lands for three days. I said, three days? He said, that's a wire transfer. Also, it's going to cost you $30. $30 to send money somewhere. So that, I thought, was a perfect little description of why we needed Bitcoin in the first place. Sending money was slow and it was expensive. The good news is I did get the Bitcoin. Uh, and it was the greatest investment that I've ever made. Of course, the price of Bitcoin went up and up over the next few years. And what I've tried to do since then is explain this concept of blockchain investing or Bitcoin investing in a way that everyone can participate in this new kind of uh, digital asset class and make it really understandable and fun to read about. So that's my that's my mission. OK. So uh, you have something in common with me because I also got into Bitcoin at 20, in 2013, and but I got in a slightly later than you. I said in your book, you said the price was in 125 around there yeah. when you got in. For yeah. me, it was around 300. So yeah, I, I'm still an early investor, but yeah, I think you got a better deal than I did. <laughs> yeah, congratulations. And what was it that made you interested in it? What sparked your interest? Well, to, to be honest, I, some people that follow my show might know already what uh, got me into it, but it was actually a VPN chat room. Like I wanted to get American Netflix here in Canada. I'm from Canada. Mm -hmm. So I so, saw because it has a much better channel lineup and things to watch. So I, uh, I, I went on the VPN chat room and they said, you should use this VPN because it accepts Bitcoin. And of course, at that point, I never heard of what Bitcoin was. And I was like, what is Bitcoin? So I did some research about it and fell down the rabbit hole. And I said, you know what? This has a lot of potential for the, for the reasons that, that you see also. And uh, it's, it's, it's crazy. So I just said, OK, I'm going to put a $20,000 of investment in it and see where it goes. So the rest is history. Good for you. That's a yeah. great story. Yeah, very similar. So how do you see the value in Bitcoin and other assets? 
Well, in uh, the book, which is called Blockchain for Everyone, uh, we really lay out a common sense way of investing in these new digital assets. And basically, you think about them like you would think about any other uh, investment out there. So if you're investing in uh, stock or uh, your friend's uh, small business startup uh, or bonds or any other investment, <clears throat> you want to really do your homework. You want to uh, think about it in a very smart and structured way, and you want to uh, not put all your eggs in one basket. So you want to diversify among many different types of investments. Uh, so those are the basic principles that, that we lay out in this book. But I didn't want it to just be a dry, boring investment book. And I didn't want it to be one of these unreadable books about blockchain. I wanted it to be really fun and enjoyable to read. So we wrap it up in a story, we tell a story, and the story is my story of buying into Bitcoin and then taking my business. I run a, a business and taking that business and putting it completely into uh, the blockchain space as well. And all the challenges that we had as we did that through the huge bull run of 2017 and then the crypto winter of 2018 and how we survived and how we endured and how we came out stronger uh on the other side and what we learned so it's a yeah. great story yeah hmm. so that's uh, you said you run a business like how did you find uh, integrating bitcoin into your business was so we have a marketing company uh called media shower and uh we have always been uh focused on kind of financial and technology clients uh, but when Bitcoin came along and I started to get involved, I said, blockchain is the next big thing. We need to take this company and we need to go all in on blockchain because this is the next big thing. You ever watch like a poker game and you see like the poker player who goes all in and just puts like all the chips in at once, Christopher? Yep. That's what we did with the company. We went all in on blockchain and uh, for the first few months it was awesome because it was 2017 money was raining from the skies no lack of clients everybody was launching a new blockchain project and then of course in 2018 suddenly everything started to dry up and we endured we said we really believe in this technology we believe in this industry we're going to keep building and keep building no matter how hard it becomes and it became very hard it was about a year of really really tough times but we came out of that those of us who have endured through this crazy roller coaster have come out stronger and we have earned the right to lead we've earned the right to lead this new financial revolution and that is a big part of our message is we are leading the global economy, those of us in this blockchain space. And that's something that's going to last for hundreds of years, far beyond uh, any of us. And that's something worth dedicating our lives to. Yeah. So you're on Cash Alternative TV. This is a show about uh, cryptocurrency, but it has a focus on Dash. So we actually have a lot of uh, commonalities between what you just said and what happens in our ecosystem because we have a treasury system that takes uh, money from the blockchain to give to contractors. So, and Dash Core Group is one of the major contractors that we have. In 2017, everything was crazy. Like we're, we're sponsoring MMA fighters. We had our advertisements on airplanes and everything else. But over 2018, as it started going down, you know, like we started having less and less money for, uh, for our treasury. And it, was, it became very much a struggle at the end. But like I said, like you said, we persevered and now we're gonna come out stronger on the other side in Dash. Yeah, that takes real belief in what you're doing, doesn't it? That it does. takes a long-term view that we're not in this to just uh, have an overnight success. We're in this to change the world. And the way that we're changing the world is we are remaking the global economy. And look, at, we all live in a global economy already. We all know this. Like what happens in China will affect the rest of the world right now for example. And uh, it's time that we move beyond this idea of nation states uh, and we begin to think of ourselves more as a human species. 
And as one human race, uh, we need one money. We need one global monetary system that works for everyone. One planet, one world, one species, one money. And that's what we're building. That's what we're all working toward at the end of the day is this global money supply. Absolutely. So what do you think uh, is going to happen? What, what, do you, what do you think of the people that have different uh, interests in cryptocurrency? Like some people want to are in it strictly to make money and other people are in it to change the world. Uh, where, where do you think that you fall in that spectrum and what are your comments on that? Well, we need people uh, with a wide variety of interests. I think one of the most important lessons that we've learned through our analysis of all these different digital assets is this concept of flow. And if you look at nature, everything is in a state of flow. So rivers flow, our blood flows, the seasons flow. And flow is good because flow means that there's movement, there's new life kind of oxygenating us or moving through us. And flow in the context of cryptocurrency or digital currencies means that people are actively using it. So in other words, we are not just hodling, but we are actively flowing this through. That means buying, selling, trading. There's movement to it. And so this is one of our big three metrics that we use to measure the health of a blockchain is this concept uh, of flow. Now, that flow takes many forms. So some people are just trying to make money. They're arbitraging on a daily basis. Well, that helps flow. So in that sense, it's good uh, for the ecosystem. Some people are building new projects. Some people are just supporting projects that have already been built. Some people are just talking about it and evangelizing this to other people. All those things help with the flow of these new digital assets. So flow is good. And blockchain projects that have good flow are healthy blockchain projects. Right. Yeah, it does. So I, I can see that you're not buying into the, the Bitcoin maximalist uh, thing where there's, there's only Bitcoin and Bitcoin's the only thing. There are, all coins are also a valuable part of this ecosystem, don't you think? Yeah, I think that we uh, need to be careful about any kind of uh, absolutist thinking uh, mm. in general in life. So uh, while I agree with Bitcoin maximalists that Bitcoin is the most successful of all the blockchain projects out there by far, uh, it also there's room for others to grow, right? There's room for other things to happen in this new technology. It's a little like saying, you know, in the early days of the Internet, well, there's only room for one website. Well, obviously, <laughs> what we had to do with the Internet was develop a framework or a structure through which a thousand flowers could bloom, all these different websites and web applications. And the same, I think, is true for blockchain. So there's lots of room. I remember a while back, uh, there was a tweet by Brian Armstrong, the CEO of Coinbase, and he was saying, all coins are a distraction. We should put all our money into Bitcoin. And now uh, all our time and effort and investment into Bitcoin. And now the guy has run so many cryptocurrencies on his website. He's changed so much over the years. And I, I like to see that because it does show that the whole blockchain space can be can be a contributor in moving this whole thing forward. Yeah. So so let's uh, enough talk about that because I know you want to talk more about Bitcoin and you want to talk about other altcoins and stuff like that. But so let's uh, talk about your book, uh, Blockchain for Everyone. Mm -hmm. uh, when it went along your travels, when you you had all these experiences in blockchain, when did you stop and say, you know what, I've got to make a book about this? Uh, I think that there were so many funny experiences that happened as we started getting involved with this cast of characters that make up this blockchain universe that it became clear. And uh, there's, a, there's a story in here where I am invited to go pitch a new blockchain project to a Polish energy drink company. So this is like the Polish equivalent of Red Bull, essentially. And they had this idea, it was a good idea, uh, that the can is the coin. So in other words, there would be some kind of token that would be launched by this company. And when you buy a can of their energy drink, there'd be a QR code on there. You'd scan in the QR code. 
uh, and then you would earn tokens or earn coins, and those coins would be redeemable, like reward points. I think it's a great idea. It's very much like loyalty programs, like Starbucks rewards, but it's on the blockchain using their own tokens. So uh, we went to go pitch this, and we had high-level buy-in. Uh, I went out to Poland to pitch this, and then I get out there, uh, and the CEO, it turns out, is not there because the CEO has flown to Bangkok. So I come to Poland to pitch to the CEO who has now flown to Bangkok. Uh, and it was that kind of just craziness, that kind of madness that we saw again and again in 2017, where people were so excited to get on board, and yet like folks seemed unable to kind of make things happen. Uh, and just so many funny stories of things like that. Uh, that's that's when I realized we, we got to capture this moment in time. We've got to capture this period in history. So 100 years from now, people will understand what we, the early pioneers, really went through to build this new ecosystem. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy that you're on the show because I do relate to you quite a bit. As we said, we, put, we both got into the space at around the same time. So it's always nice to talk to another crypto pioneer. Mm -hmm. So, John, you said that you wrote this book uh, not just once, but twice. What was the story behind that? I worked with my editor, Jeremy Ruby Strauss, at Simon & Schuster uh, Gallery Books, and this is my third book with him, and I really trust his opinion. He uh, He's had a number of New York Times bestsellers and just a very smart guy. So I wrote the first version uh, of the book, and I sent Jeremy the manuscript and uh, it was a series of essays about how blockchain was going to change the world. So Jeremy reads it and he calls me back and he says, uh, John, this is how he talks. He goes, uh, John, I, uh, the first section's pretty good. The, uh, the second section needs some work. There were four sections. Uh, the, the third section uh, needs a complete rewrite. And the fourth section, just get rid of that altogether. So I was like, Thank you for that honest feedback, you dick. I didn't say, I didn't say you dick. He's a great guy. Uh, so anyway, I went back and I reread it and I said, he's right, he's right, because we have to make this subject interesting. We have to make it great. We're so passionate about this that we have to make it readable. So I rewrote the entire book and I rewrote it, as I said, as a story. I rewrote it as a kind of hero's journey, sort of a Star Wars mythology of going into this new space, this new Bitcoin blockchain space, facing all these trials and challenges, finding my Obi-Wan Kenobi, finding my helper, who was a fellow named Richard Castelline, who was also Canadian. I called him my Canadian Yoda. And finding these people who helped us make it through so that we came out the other side as mighty Jedi warriors. And that is the story of this book. So I sent the second version back to Jeremy and I said, uh, what'd you think? And he goes, we got a page turner. He said, I sat down and I read that entire book cover to cover, one sitting, eight hours. That never happens. Wow. And I said, Jeremy, I will feed on that praise for the next five years. So uh, you guys thought right away that this was going to be a moneymaker, right? Yeah, we were really excited about the opportunity to present this new technology in a really fun and creative way, telling a story around it. Because no one had done that. All the blockchain books to date they were kind of boring, to be honest. I'm interested in this stuff, and I would be usually falling asleep by the third chapter. So uh, we all felt like this is a book that you could make a movie out of. Like, there's really just a great story behind this uh, that also teaches you the basics of blockchain and investing in this in these new digital assets. So was I right in uh, saying that you wanted to include Bitcoin with your uh, book? And how, how did that turn out? Yeah, so I had this great idea uh, to say, uh, what if when somebody buys the book, they get a little bit of Bitcoin bundled inside? So like the Polish energy drink, the idea was uh, that we would have a little QR code. And when you would you know, open the book, 
you would have a little QR code that you could scan and that would give you a little bit of Bitcoin. And Jeremy says to me, uh, the last time I heard an original idea in the book industry was never. And that is an original idea. And I said, could you imagine if the price of Bitcoin then shot up? So let's say we bought, you know, $10 of Bitcoin to put in the book. And then the price of Bitcoin, like, you know, triples. The Bitcoin would be worth more than the book. Like you would have to hire security guards to guard the books in bookstores because they would fly off the shelves. So we were excited, but it turns out that it's actually technically very difficult to include Bitcoin for a variety of reasons. But what we did instead was we did a deal with Maker and Coinbase, and uh, they generously donated uh, a large sum of DAI, which is, the, of course, the stable coin. And when you buy the book, through our special website, which is blockchainforeveryone.com. When you buy the book through blockchainforeveryone.com, you get $25 worth of DAI. And just like we envisioned, there's a QR code on a little bookmark and you scan it in and it opens a Coinbase wallet and you have your $25 of DAI pre-funded. So the book costs about $25 and it's $25 worth of DAI. So it's essentially like you're getting the book for free. Okay. So that's uh, good for my viewers that might want to be interested in your book and reading all about your experiences. Uh, you can yeah. do it for free and uh, be involved with DAI. Uh, this, uh, it's a stable coin out there, so uh, it's not going to go down in value anytime soon. So that's good. So you said this uh, book is more, uh, more than a how-to. It's like a spiritual journey for you, like a quest. Could you, could you describe how that is? Well, the book is a book about how to reinvent yourself. And uh, I believe that the world is moving so fast today. Uh, technology changes so quickly that we are called on to constantly reinvent ourselves. Uh, most of us don't have one career anymore. We have many careers. Uh, we have many careers, many, many careers. And to do that, we have to always be learning. We have to always be adding to our skill stack. So uh, like you, Christopher, when I started learning about Bitcoin, I just devoured everything that I could find about this new technology and about the blockchain technology it was, it was built on. And by doing that, I slowly became an expert uh, in, this, in this space. And by doing that, I was able to reinvent not just my career, but also our company as I mentioned, uh, and I was able to have all of these amazing adventures. I travel around the world now speaking to audiences about this technology. This is radically different from where my life was just five years ago. So this idea of constantly reinventing ourselves is, I think, an important part of the human journey. It's also an important message for today because we train our kids, we train students as if they're gonna do one thing for their entire life. And that's not the way the world works anymore. We've gotta constantly be learning. And this book is a great way to learn about this new technology. Absolutely. Uh, so there was one scene in your book where you uh, were in the Fed and you were trying to end the Fed. What, what, what was going on with that story? So the Federal Reserve is of course our central bank uh, of the United States, but it's also a series of buildings. There are uh, 12 or 13 Federal Reserve branches, and there's one here in Boston where, uh, where I'm located. And I had been invited to a cryptocurrency conference, a blockchain conference at the Fed. Uh, and so I heard the speakers, it was really great. And after the conference, I had a uh, call for my business. So as I said, we were now working as a marketing company with these new blockchain projects. And I've got this sales call with our sales team. And uh, because I was in the Federal Reserve, I had to go downstairs and take it. And the only place I could find was the lunchroom of the Fed. So I'm literally in the belly of the beast. <laughs> I am in the commissary of the central bank of the United States. 
And as I'm talking with this new potential client, it turns out that he is launching a stable coin. Well, now we all know what a stable coin is. Uh, it's a coin that holds its value against the dollar. But at the time, this was kind of a, a new concept. So I'm hearing this pitch from this guy who is trying to essentially undo the Fed in the basement of the Fed. And I thought, this is like an irony sandwich. This is like <laughs> irony stacked between tender slices of irony. And uh, once again, it just shows you how crazy this industry is. And then just this morning, I was reading about the Fed now experimenting with a new digital dollar, which is essentially going to be a blockchain-based unit of currency, a blockchain-based digital dollar that will compete with all of these stable coins out there. So it just shows how all of this is inevitable. It's definitely the way that we're moving. Uh, so can you go more into detail about that? Do you know more details about this uh, stable coin from the U.S.? I haven't heard about it. Uh, I just read a news report this morning, and I can say that this is driven, uh, I think, largely by China, which is, of course, uh, reportedly working on its own version of digital currency. So I believe that what will happen is uh, each nation will see that if they don't develop a blockchain-based digital dollar or their own version of digital currency, a digital euro, digital yuan, et cetera, that they will be left behind uh, because the benefits of going fully digital on a blockchain-based digital ledger uh, far outweigh any risks. In some sense, it's, it's inevitable the way that things are moving. So I think we're going to see a kind of like currency war uh, over the next uh, five years or so where every nation is creating their own digital currency equivalent and trying to establish theirs as the standard. Then separately, we're going to have projects like Facebook's Libra uh, and we're going to have stable coins like Tether and US dollar coin. And all of these to some degree are going to be trying to find their place in this new global economy of the future. And it's one of the most exciting industries to be part of today. Yeah, it's like uh, you're, we're making an omelet right now and we don't know how it's gonna turn out. You're throwing all these ingredients in and eventually it's gonna turn out a certain way, but we'd have no idea how it's gonna turn out. Uh, you're, you're involved in Bitcoin. I, I'm heavily involved in Dash. Uh, you, we got nation states that are out there trying to do the same thing. It's like. You know, it's it's very exciting, like you said, because the future is so uncertain. You know, yeah. we think we think we know how it's going to turn out, but but we actually don't. And it's just, you know, it's very exciting to be part of it. I'm I'm very happy to share it with you, and uh, happy that you're here on my show today. So, John, do you have any excerpts from your book that you'd like to share with our viewers? I do. This is chapter thirty three called "Crazy Rich Asians," and this is about uh, my speaking circuit that I started to uh, be invited to as I got deeper and deeper into blockchain. There was no ping pong table. This bummed me out. I was at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, the tech capital of the world, Nerdvana. There had to be N ping pong tables within radius R, but I could not solve for N. First, there was me trying to explain to my Chinese host why I needed a ping pong table to talk about blockchain, then trying to squeeze my own ping pong table into my tiny electric car, getting quotes for ping pong table delivery. I'd been practicing ping pong for weeks, but ping pong is a game of finesse, not force. Accepting defeat, I propose I prepared a ping pong video instead. I want to begin today, I began by talking about ping pong. I was speaking to the Boston Chinese Investment Club, a group born out of the MIT Sloan School of Management, a school that had minted its fair share of tech millionaires. Blockchain investing was all the rage in China, all the more so because initial coin offerings, ICOs, had recently been banned by the Chinese government. Now all the money was moving to Hong Kong, and to the United States. 
which was why I was standing in a lecture hall at MIT speaking to a small room of wealthy Chinese investors, most of whom had no idea who I was, what I was saying, or why I was bringing up ping pong. Yes, ping pong, I repeated. Much has been made of the trade war between our great nations, and the danger is that we fall into another Cold War like the one that existed between us during the 1950s and 1960s. Do you remember how we thawed that Cold War? I asked. Ping pong, announced one elderly gentleman in the back. Ping pong. I gave him a thumbs up and clicked to my next slide. Here's a photo of the best teams from China and America playing ping pong. We called it ping pong diplomacy, and it led to this. I clicked up a picture of Mao Zedong meeting with Richard Nixon. Not our best president, I said, but not our worst. Easy laugh. How many of you know this man, I asked, advancing another slide. A hand went up. Who is it? Ma Long, replied a well-dressed woman. Ma Long, I shouted, startling even myself. During the 2016 Summer Olympics, my brother and I watched the great Chinese table tennis player Ma Long with a mixture of fascination and awe. Absolute fanboys. And when he would score a point on a forearm power smash, we would go like this. I cut my hands to my mouth. Ma Long! They may have been crazy rich Asians, but they were looking at me regular crazy. Watch this, I said, and pulled up a YouTube video that showed Ma Long facing off against Japan's world champion, Jun Mitsutani. The volleys grow more and more frenetic with both opponents several feet from the table, swinging their paddles full force, the ball a blur. Then Ma Long goes in for a final return, checks himself, and the ball misses the table by inches. Ma Long's point. The crowd on the video goes berserk. Come on, I told the crowd, cupping my mouth. Ma Long! And they did it. They actually did the Ma Long chant. My point is that competition can be fun. It can be a game. Our politicians talk about trade wars, but a game is the opposite of a war. A game is something we play together. And I think as we go into this new era of currency wars between China's digital currency and the United States digital currency and all the other nations, we can look upon it as a game, as something we can do to work together to form one global currency, a global digital currency. And that's the message I want to leave your viewers with today, Christopher. Okay. So just one last question before I let you go. Uh, what do you see for the short-term and long-term future of digital currency? As you mentioned earlier, like with the nation state coins and with the private, uh, public blockchains and everything else, how do you see that sorting out in the, in the, in the near future and also in the long-term? Well, again, I think that uh, individual countries will start minting their own digital currencies. China will probably be first. The United States won't be far behind, and everyone else will try to catch up quickly. Um, the long-term outcome of that uh, could go one of two ways. One is that we have a largely fragmented financial economy, much the way we do today, where every nation has their own currency and they don't really work together very well. Uh, the second would be that we work together to form a one world global digital currency that works for everyone equally. Uh, that to me is the way that it is inevitable that we will eventually go. I don't know how long it will take us to get there, but it's something I believe in. And, uh, and I hope that uh, we can all do our part to make that happen. Okay. Well, it was nice to meet you, John Hargrave. Thanks for coming on Cash Alternative TV today. Uh, so it was a treat for my viewers. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me, Christopher. Uh, enjoy the rest of your day and have a great uh, time. I hope we look forward to your next book. Can't wait. Thank you. <laughs> Cheers. Bye now.
Well, that was my interview with Sir John Hargrave. I hope you enjoyed it. Don't forget to like this video, subscribe, and click the bell if you want to see more from me and Cash Alternative TV episodes. Until next time, remember, Dash is a better money for a better future. And that future is getting closer every day. Bye for now.